What you're about to watch is a compilation of some recent videos that have appeared here on Three Oceans. These videos will demonstrate the flagrant abuse by liberal and NDP MPs of the public money they are entrusted with, and this is especially bad given that Canadians have had it harder than they've had in a long time. In fact, 25% of Canadians are presently suffering in poverty. What's even worse is in the case of Nikki Ashton, 64% of the children in her writing are living in poverty, which makes her writing the one with the most child poverty in Canada. It's pretty bad. I'd like to say enjoy what you're about to watch, but I guess the best you do is just watch and take note. If you missed out on the final question period prior to the summer recess, you missed out on a few fireworks. I'm not going to cover everything that went on in the House of Commons yesterday, but we are going to take a look at the fatal uppercut Pierre Polyev saved for the very last question of the session. I'll be honest, I was starting to lose faith because news that the Liberals blew through $220,000 worth of airplane food on one trip is bad enough on its own. But it also happened to come out on the same day as a report that revealed 25% of Canadians are living in poverty. Let me repeat, an entire quarter of our country's population is living in poverty. Mathematically speaking, you and everyone else watching this video know someone who is on the cusp of financial disaster. So you can bet I was expecting the Conservatives to bring this up during question period, and just when it looked like it wasn't going to be mentioned, well, let's just watch for ourselves, shall we? Will the Prime Minister finally put an end to this costly, self-licking ice cream cone and stop sending the bill to Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the only Canadians we're asking to pay a little more are those uh, who've been very successful in these past years and are able to make more than $250,000 in profit from selling off investments. These are things uh, that we think we can be asking of Canadians who've been successful to support Canadians who need a little more help, whether it's with the most ambitious housing plan this country's ever seen, whether it's dental care that's already delivered supports in just eight weeks to 200,000 seniors, or whether it's more spaces in childcare. But the Conservatives continue to protect the wealthiest instead of supporting Canadians. Trudeau is usually good at thinking on his feet, but when he starts mispronouncing words and lapsing into his uh, uh, uh fits, you know he's getting flustered. But why would he be getting flustered now? Question period is almost over, which means Trudeau can spend the next three months looking at himself in a mirror and listening to recordings of his speeches. Could it be he's on edge because he's waiting for what Polyev is about to serve up next? By the way, pay close attention to Michelle Ferrari's face in the background. You can tell she had been waiting for this moment the entire question period, and the look of satisfaction on her face says it all. Things are about to get rowdy. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. That's a little bit rich coming from him as he raises taxes on single moms for the crime of driving to the grocery store while he treats himself to a jet-setting experience where the food on the plane out of a six-day trip was $220,000 beef brisket. Parsley potatoes with truffle oil, beef tenderloin with port wine sauce, braised lamb shanks, and even cheese case cake with pistachio brittle. Mr. Speaker, with Canadians lined up at the food bank, what's on the menu for this Prime Minister this summer? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives continue to use cheap attacks and slogans uh, when they stand against support directly for Canadians. Right Honourable Prime Minister from the top, please. Now, if you thought that heckling was something, just you wait. It gets infinitely rowdier from there. Be sure to watch the faces on the Liberals very closely. You can tell they were anticipating this moment, and now that Trudeau has been cornered with the question, after having already endured an hour of attacks, you can see they're wondering if he can talk the Liberals out of this scandal. Speaker, the 
conservative leader continues to use cheap attacks and slogans uh, while he tries to hide from the fact that he is standing with the wealthiest Canadians and against the idea of them paying a little more so that Canadians, can, young Canadians can buy a home, so that seniors can get their teeth fixed, so that young families can find a place in childcare. These are the investments we're making that they are standing against, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to deliver for Canadians who need them while he chooses to protect the interests of his wealthy friends. Here, here. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, there's nothing cheap about the $220,000 that he spent on one trip for food alone. Looks like Lord Justin's word salad didn't bolster the confidence of his caucus as they're now trying to silence Pierre with some heckling when he repeats the question. The Honourable uh, Leader of the Opposition uh, asked this question. I ask all members to please keep their voices down. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition from, from the top. There's nothing cheap, Mr. Speaker, about the Prime Minister spending $220,000 for food alone on a six-day jet-setting tour for himself. All the while, homelessness up 38 percent. Toronto has 256 homeless encampments, where one in ten people in that city are now eating at food banks. They join two million Canadians. The good news is life was not like this before this Prime Minister, and it won't be like this after he's gone. Can we not have a carbon tax election now to choose a government that will axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime? Smells like the cup. The, the right honorable prime minister. Remember when I told you you hadn't seen the rowdy yet? Well, here it comes. Mr. Speaker, once again, we see the extent of... Really not sure what triggered that, but you can see that while chanting, the conservatives all turned backwards and looked up, leading us to believe a visitor had said something they clearly approved of. If you listen carefully, you'll also hear one of the conservatives shout to the liberals that they're over 20 points behind. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the conservatives over this past session have stood in this house to stand against dental care for seniors. They have stood in this house to stand against expanding child care investments and spaces. They have stood in this house to stand against the kinds of investments that are helping Canadians uh, with diabetes, uh, Canadians afford uh, birth control. These are the choices that they are making. Now, they're filled with slogans and bumper stickers that don't solve problems but amplify anger while we are focused Focus on supporting Canadians. Canadians can make their choice about the kind of country they want to live in. And that's how the session of Parliament came to an end with another patented Trudeau word salad that completely dodges the question that was asked of him. Well, no matter. We all knew that would be the outcome of Polyev asking the question, and the Conservatives were ready for it, and they're now already leveraging Trudeau's response to remind voters just how dismissive and out of touch he is. So how do you feel about the Conservatives' performance in this final question period? Did he do a stellar job, or do you feel that there's room for improvement? Let us know in the comments. Thank you very much for watching, and please do consider subscribing if you haven't done so already.
Margaret Thatcher once said, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. We're clearly seeing that playing out here in Canada with the Liberals hiking the capital gains tax to compensate for their drunken spending spree. But we're going, but we're not going to speak about the Liberals today. We do plenty of that already. But just before we dive in, I just want to ask you to consider subscribing to this channel as there is going to be a big announcement coming regarding censorship on YouTube and social media in general. The best way to get the notification for that announcement is to subscribe to to this channel. The right is heavily censored on social media and I learn from my mistakes. So once again, please do consider subscribing. So today's video is for the first time about the NDP, more specifically about that party's most truant MP, Nikki Ashton. Parliamentary travel records indicate that Ashton was only in Ottawa on one occasion for four days during the fall 2022 sitting. I mean, wow, that is something else. So right off the bat, we can say that she quite literally phones it in. Her excuse for being chronically absent from the House of Commons, I hope you guys are ready for this. She says it's because she's the mother of two young children. What I would give to sit Nikki down with my mother right now. But anyways, that's, I just don't know what to say anymore. But now it's been revealed that not only is she terminally addicted to those precious sick days, she also fleeced Canada's taxpayers for close to $18,000 for a personal trip. Ashton did her level best to justify her holiday with, with saying that she did so to attend meetings with stakeholders about business of the house. A spokesperson for Ashton tried to run additional damage control by saying she was in Quebec to discuss language priorities because she's the party's critic for official languages and needed to find out things she needed to prioritize. Let's get serious. No one is doing work during the holidays and that was proven by Ashton's own social media feeds. Her Instagram feed was packed full of pictures of her frolicking through the holidays with her husband and her kids. So let's get back to that trip for a sec. As mentioned, we already covered she billed taxpayers for almost $18,000 for a trip from Manitoba to Quebec. Think about that for a second. The average cost of a plane ticket for that flight is $500 per person, meaning her family should have been able to fly out for somewhere around $2,000. And you know what they paid for that airfare? $13,619. That's right. That's how much that sum went just to airfare alone. Here's socialism for you folks. That's it right there in a nutshell. Ashton doesn't believe she has to put in the work like everyone else, and yet she feels completely entitled to your money. She brings in a salary of $203,000 per year, and yet somehow that's not enough for her to cover her own personal expenses. This is not only abuse of the public purse, this should be treated as fraud. Sound off about how you feel about this abuse in the comments. Thank you very much for watching. Please consider subscribing. If I asked you why Pierre Polyev is doing so much better than anyone on the Liberal team right now, there are a number of obvious reasons you could throw my way. Like, the Liberals are going on 10 years and people are fatigued. Liberal policies aren't working out. Trudeau is a true douche. And you'd be right by giving any or all of these answers. But one of the key reasons Polyev is bringing home the bacon while the Liberals cry themselves to sleep at night can be attributed to a factor the Liberals couldn't begin to understand even if they tried. Simply put, Pierre can connect with people. He can relate with blue collars and white collars alike. He makes an effort to understand where individuals are coming from, and that is one of the many components that make up his success. Also, when campaigning, he welcomes liberal voters to talk to him. He won't try and sell them, he'll just talk to them. Liberals, on the other hand, are living up quite miserably to that stigma of them being the party of elitists. Lately, it's becoming even more evident. We all saw what happened with Jennifer Connelly's now infamous boo-hoo get over it comment in light of revelations that there are traitors in the House of Commons. I'll put a link to the Connolly compilation I made a few weeks ago in the comments, but check out this exchange between her and Leslyn Lewis. I'm just curious if she thinks there should be consequences or... Uh or retromand for members of this house who meet with known Nazis who spread uh, misinformation, disinformation, glorify the Holocaust, who speak against uh, uh, anti-Muslim rhetoric. Uh, I'm just curious if she's talking about online hate and privacy of Canadians and regulation. Does she condemn her actions by meeting with a known Nazi uh, in this country who spout anti-Muslim rhetoric? The Prime Minister 
has put on blackface so many times. He has degraded black people. He literally put a banana in his pants. And you have the audacity, you have the audacity to stand and look at me as a black woman and ask about my meeting with another member of the European Parliament. That is within my job description. I do not have to, I do not have to approve of everything that another member believes in in order to have the decency to have meetings with with other individuals. Your prime minister, this prime minister, denigrated black men by putting a banana in his pants. Shame on every member over there that does not chastise them. If this were any other country, he would not be leading and he would not have the moral authority to lead. He would not have that moral authority. Order. Damn. And then we have Christopher Freeland, who is quite likely the most unlikable of all the liberals on the roster. Still, you'd think she'd have better sense than to commit this faux pas. That is Leslie's vision. That's the liberal vision. That's why I'm really calling on the people of St. Paul's to go out there and vote for her. Because the alternative is really cold and cruel and small. The alternative is cuts and austerity, not believing in ourselves as a country, not believing in our communities and in our neighbors. Now, while Jennifer O'Connelly's boohoo was indeed misplaced, at least we could say that it was not a direct message against a segment of the population. It was more a reflection of the defensive stance the Liberal Party is taking to shield itself from the inevitable. But for Freeland to openly backhand conservative voters across the chops with a comment like that one? Well, it shows they are a party of -of out-of-touch elitists who know they're going nowhere past 2025 and now they're lashing out at the filthy plebs they deem responsible for their coming demise. And I can assure you right now, you will be seeing footage of Freeland's words replayed in future conservative election ads. And why not? If your opponents insist on gifting you with free ammunition, it'd be a little silly to ignore it. And now we have one of the reigning lords of the liberal elitists, Mark Lurch Adams Miller. I'm really perplexed, honestly, as to how Miller and Trudeau can be best friends. Trudeau is somewhat light in spirit, a little more playful, while Miller always looks like he's got this rank pickle planted firmly up that ginger butt of his. When he does smile, it's like the supreme beings controlling him suddenly remember they have to convince us he's a real human, and they suddenly push a button to give us that grin of chiclets. And when Miller does have a giggle, or a smile, it's always at the strangest moments. Like, there's no reason to be laughing or smiling. Kind of like Arthur Fleck in A Joker, who's laughing at everything that comedian says, except for the actual jokes. Here's what Miller really thinks of conservative voters. And my question is, why then? I think he's the best place to to beat Pierre Polyev, who, uh, as I've said publicly, is a fake. Uh, He doesn't present any concrete vision of Canada that that I support. He's a guy full of slogans. most people don't really know what they mean. They, they, they may be catchy, but he reminds me of a, of a wrestling manager from the 80s just yelling <laughs> slogans with the heel and everyone likes to boo or to cheer. I mean, this is just, I don't know how this is, why this has become the state of Canadian politics, uh, but that's the reality of, of what I see. Um, it's not a WWF match. This is reality. Canadians are suffering and we need to fight for them. So, um, Prime Minister has a vision. We are a government that's eight or nine years old. I understand people can get tired of the government in place, lots, of, lots has happened, whether uh, people are right or wrong, they do blame the government for a number of things that are going on, uh, isn't a question of blaming, but that's the reality that people are feeling. We got a message that was loud and clear from Toronto St. Paul's, that was uh, what was considered a quote unquote safe riding, we should absolutely never take anything for granted as a government, and we need to listen to the people that voted in the way they voted, uh, screw our heads on better, and then move on. Well, you know what? I personally feel there's nothing wrong with wrestling or the fans who love wrestling. But the way Miller is dropping that one sounds like he has nothing but disdain for wrestling fans and that he thinks the only people who are dumb enough to fall for Polyev's populism are dumb hicks who wear stone cold t-shirts to weddings. All three of these examples are clear indicator of what is a collective sentiment within the Liberal Party. That sentiment being that conservative voters are low-grade, underachieving pieces of trailer park trash. 
That's why they don't care about the housing crisis. That's why they don't care about food inflation. They figure the people most affected by it are dumb hillbilly plebes who live in blue rural writings. Well, Toronto St. Paul's isn't poor, and it sure as hell isn't the sticks either. We owe it to ourselves and other voters in the future to remind them of the contemptuous view liberals have of their opponents. Sound off in the comments. Thank you very much for watching, and please consider subscribing if you haven't done so already. A couple of weeks ago, I broke a story about Nikki Ashton in which I detailed a personal trip she took to Quebec City with her husband and children. She billed taxpayers $18,000 for that personal trip. She later went on to claim that the reason for the trip was to meet with quote-unquote stakeholders in Quebec City for matters relating to language and culture, and yet she refuses to divulge the identity of these so-called stakeholders. I mean, once again, she was meeting with them to discuss matters relating to language and culture. This is not matters of national security. So why is she she being so secretive about who she met with there. Shortly after I published that video, and I will publish a link to it in the show notes, taxpayers took to social media to completely chastise her for her behavior and demand that she either resign, repay the money, or both. Well, we're at least getting a small fraction of that money back, $2,900 of it to be precise. Beyond that, Nikki is claiming she owes no other money that the rest really was for government business, despite the fact that en route to Quebec City, they stopped in Ottawa for what she claimed to be dealing with a bed bug problem in the building or apartment that she lives in. I'm not quite sure about that statement because she does use both of those words, building and the apartment. So this leads us to speculate. Does she own that building? Because if she does, the bed bug problem is her and her husband's problem, not the taxpayer's problem. Why would we pay for her to fly out to Ottawa to deal with her private property? Now, let's say she really is just renting it for the time that she spends in Ottawa, which is very minimal, let me tell you right now. If she is the renter, Ottawa has protocols in place for its MPs. Why is it that no one on the ground in Ottawa could take care of the bed bug problem for her on her behalf. Why is it that she had to fly all the way from Manitoba to attend to this issue and also bring her husband? How can one adult not deal with a bed bug problem on their own? I don't get it. And why is it that the House of Commons agreed to pay the bill for her husband's flight to deal with the bed bug problem? Now here's a factoid you really need to hear. Nikki's writing of Churchill, are you ready for this? Her writing of Churchill has the highest level of child poverty, not just in Manitoba, but in all of Canada. Do you know what the rate of child poverty is in her writing? 64%. 64% of the children living in her writing are living in poverty. And this woman, who is supposed to be part of Canada's Socialist Party, the NDP, a party that is supposed to be all about fighting poverty, is using taxpayer money to take personal trips at a time when her writing has the highest level of child poverty and she is dinging taxpayers for $18,000 for a pleasure trip. At what point are we finally going to feel outrage over this? At what point are we going to be so furious about what they're doing that we will not stop until they get fired or they resign? But this is unacceptable. It also needs to be known that Nikki, despite being the member of Canada's third ranking party, ranks number six out of all the MPs. And of those MPs, I'm also including the four party leaders. She ranks as the sixth highest spender on travel out of all the MPs in the house. And she's in the same group as the party leaders. It doesn't make sense to me. It also needs to be said that out of all the parties, the NDP has the highest per member spend on travel expenses at roughly $60,000 each. That 60 grand happens to be $16,000 more than the average of all other MPs. That's insane. So you tell me, is Nikki getting served too hard for what she did or not quite hard enough? Why is it that her party, the NDP, the party that is supposed to be fighting against poverty, is creating so much more of it and ignoring it? Sound off in the comments. Thank you very much for watching. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing. When I posted a video about the NDP's Nikki Ashton billing an $18,000 personal vacation for her family of four to taxpayers, the public went nuts. If you missed that video, I'll have a link to it in the video description. While most of us have grown cynical of politicians in general, 
a lot of people expected more from not just any MP, but one that belongs to the NDP. After all, they are supposed to be the party of the working man. They're supposed to be the ones who empathize with the struggle of the average person. Well, it's definitely not sunny ways for the NDP anymore. Sunny ways, my friends. Sunny ways. For more than two years now, the people have been calling on Jagmeet Singh to pull the plug on his supply and confidence agreement with Justin Trudeau. No matter what Trudeau does that violates the principles of the NDP or goes against their mandate, you can count on Jagmeet to prop up the prince. By now, we all know why. Jagmeet will be eligible for a pension come February 2025. So I think it's about time we finally look at exactly how much Jagmeet stands to withdraw from the public purse. If you suffer from any form of hypertension, don't watch the rest of this video before taking your meds. Yes, it really is that bad. Jagmeet could be in line to pick up to seven figures worth of pension payments and that'll be broken down in a second. First, let's start with how obscene the qualifying window is. Six years. Find me a job in the private sector, outside of sea levels of course, that'll set you up with a pension for such a small amount of time on the job. Just to be clear, that doesn't make me anti-pension. I fully believe the men and women serving in parliament should get some degree of money upon retirement in exchange for their years of service. However, the way the system is set up now, the pension is viewed as a prize rather than fair compensation for the time that MP gave up to sit in the House of Commons. Now let's rip into the numbers which come to us courtesy of Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, and I'm paraphrasing. With just six years under his belt, it's not like Singh could be retiring with a massive pension, and the 44-year-old will still need to wait until the age of 55 to start collecting, but it would be a nice cushion for him at that time. According to numbers calculated by the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, Singh's annual pension in 2034, when he turns 55, would be worth $45,000 per year, more than many retirees live on. Because the MP pension is indexed, by the time Singh reaches the age of 60, his annual pension will be worth $54,000 a year. If the NDP leader lived until the age of 90, a very reasonable assumption, Singh's total payout to that point would be $2.3 million according to the Federation. Do not for a moment think that once Jagmeet's political career ends, he'll end up on Skid Row feeding his children dumpster cabbage. As a former federal MP and the leader of a national political party, he'll be heavily sought after by law firms across the country. Given how other lawyers have served as MPs, he'll command a top salary and that pension will be the icing on the cake. How would you handle the business of MP pensions if you were in a position to do so? I'd love to see your ideas in the comments. Thank you very much for watching, and if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing.